Hello everyone. Thanks for your interest in this presentation where we'll present why and how we built a 100% SILADB shardware application using Rust. I'm Alexi, uh, CTO of Numberly, and if you ever attended a SILADB submit before, you might remember me, or most probably my French accent. Today, I'm delighted to and honored to share the stage this year with two wonderful colleagues of mine, Joseph and Yasir. Before Yasir tells you how it works for real and Joseph shares our learnings and future plans, let me introduce you to how we got there in the first place. At Numberly, the omnichannel delivery team has the ownership of all the types of messages we support and operate for our clients. From the well-known and established email to the still emerging RCS without forgetting the OTT platforms such as WhatsApp. The team recently got the chance to build a platform to rule them all with the goal of streamlining how all our components send and track messages, whatever their form. The general logic is as follows. Clients or programmatic platforms send messages or batch of the messages using REST API gateways, which are responsible for validating and rendering the message payload. Then those gateways will all converge towards a central message routing platform, which will implement full featured scheduling, accounting, tracing, and of course, routing of the messages using the right platform or operator connectors. As of today, our architecture has this general pipeline dedicated to each message channel, which is a burden to keep up to date and most importantly, makes it hard to bring feature parity amongst all of them. Here comes our central messaging routing platform, taking care of everything with an omni-channel attitude. Now, putting all your eggs in one basket is always risky, right? Making this kind of move puts a lot of constraints to our platform requirements. It has to be very reliable. First, as being highly available and resilient. Second, as being able to scale fast to match the growth of one or multiple channels at once. High availability and scale were the easy parts when compared to our observability and idempotence requirements. When you imagine all your messages going through a single place, the ability to trace what happens to every single one of them or a group of them becomes a real challenge. Even worse, one of the greatest challenges out there, even more in a distributed system, is the idempotence guarantee that we lacked so far on the other pipelines. Guaranteeing that a message cannot be sent twice is easier said than done. At this point, I'm going to walk you through our design process. We split up our objectives into three main concepts that we seek to strictly respect. The first one is reliability. We wanted to design something that is simple with a lot with something like shared almost nothing architecture components. Then we strive for low coupling, keeping remote dependency to its minimum. Then it was about the coding language. We needed a performance with explicit pattern and strict paradigm uh, language. Then comes the scale. On the application layer, we wanted to rely on something that makes it easy to deploy and scale with a lot of resilience, obviously. The data bus has a lot of uh, things uh, entitled to high throughput, highly resilient, horizontally scalable, time and order preserving, obviously, capabilities message bus. That's a lot uh, on, on the data bus side. On the data querying as well, we wanted low latency for one or many query support. Last but not least, idempotence. We wanted a strong processing isolation. Our workload distribution should be deterministic to scale and be efficient from the start to the end. When you try to combine all those concepts into an architecture at Numberly, you could end up with something like this. You would deploy your application on Kubernetes, and then you would use maybe Kafka 
as a message bus to transfer the message to your central message routing platform, which in turn will might be, might be using Kafka to hold some kind of ordered queue of the message it has to process. Then to keep on the state and all the things that you need to be able to store and retrieve, we would use Scylla. And since you want this to be efficient everywhere, you would maybe need uh, Redis as a hot cache. All right. But this apparently simple go-to architecture has caveats that breaks too much of the concepts that we promise to stick with. Let's, le let's look at the reliability one. Three data uh, architectures and technologies means three factors to design reliability upon. Each of them could fail for different reasons that our platform logic should handle. On the scalability side, we can immediately see that we are lucky to have a data tech to match each scalability constraint, but the combination of the three does not match reliability and its importance. This, this adds too much complexity and point of failures to be efficiently implemented. Idem potence, as expected, becomes as well a nightmare when you imagine achieving it on such a complex ecosystem. So we decided to be bold and make a big statement. We'll only use one data technology and hold everything together with it. Scylla was the best suited to face the challenge. It's highly available, of course. It scales amazingly. It offers ridiculous fast queries for both single and range queries, which means that it can also be thought as a distributed cache efficiently replacing Redis. Now, replacing Kafka as an ordered data bus is not so trivial using Scylla, but it seems doable somehow. The, big, the biggest piece of the cake that we had to tackle was how can we get a deterministic workload distribution, if possible, for free? That's where I got what turned out to be not a so crazy idea after all. What if I used SciladB's shard per core architecture inside my own application? For those not familiar with the amazing shard per core architecture of SciladB, I'll try my best to make it clear. Avi and Dor, please forgive me if I say something wrong. So, the main idea is that the partition key of your data table design determines not only which node is responsible for a copy of the data, but also which CPU core I.O. scheduler gets to handle its processing. You got it right. SciladB distributes the data in a deterministic fashion down to a single CPU core. So, my naive idea was to distribute our own messaging platform processing using the exact same logic of SciladB. The expected effect would be to actually align Scylla's per core processing with our own applications and benefit from all the latency scaling reliability that comes with it. That's how we effectively created a 100% shardware application. And if you set aside the hard work it took to make it happen, it brings amazing properties on the table. Deterministic workload distribution, super optimized data processing capacity aligned from the application down to the storage layer, strong latency and isolation warranties per application instance, and of course, infinite scale following SciladB's scale. Yes, yeah. We have an enthusiastic crowd eager to know how we build that 100% shadow application. Can you walk them through that, please? Of course, Alexi. So, now that we got our actuator inspiration, it was time to answer the perpetual question. Which language should we use? Well, we knew that we need a modern language who should be reliable, secure, safe, and efficient to build our platform. But also, we knew that our sharding algorithm will need and requires a performance and the blazing performance for hashing and should have a good synergy with the Scylla driver. So, that said, it was no longer a dilemma. The answer was so obvious for us, Rust will fill our needs. 
but okay between you and me the truth is that also alexi was already sold to Silla and to rescue at that point our stack was born so let's get into the platform internals and how we achieve our objectives with Silla db in our architecture incoming messages are handled by a component that we call the ingester. For each message we receive, after the usual verifications and validations, we calculate the shard to which the message belongs and will be stored in CLDB. More exactly, we compute a partition key that matches the CLDB's storage replica, nodes, and the CPU core for our messages partition key effectively align our application's processing with CLDB's CPU core. Once this partition key is calculated to match CLDB storage layer, we persist this message with all his data in the message table and at the same time adds its metadata to the table named buffer with the calculating partition key. The buffer table is a corner store in our distribution design. The partition key itself is a tuple of the channel and the shard number. This allows us to use a dedicated worker per channel type and shard couple. The clustering key is a timestamp to preserve the insertion time order. This timestamp is the current timestamp as calculated by Sila. This is the important detail that I'll get back to it later. Now, the data is stored in CLADB. Let's talk about the second component, which is called the scheduler. Schedulers will simply consume the ordered data from the buffer table and effectively proceed with the message routing logic. Following the SHARD2 component architecture, a scheduler will exclusively consume the messages of the specific SHARD, just like a CPU core is assigned to slice of CLADB data. The scheduler will fetch a slice of the data that is not that it is responsible for from the buffer table. This is the crucial part of our flow. We will see it in details in the next slides. At this point, the scheduler will have the IDs of all the messages it should process. Then it fetch the message details from the message table. The scheduler then process and send the messages to the right channel is it res responsible for. As you can see, each component of the platform is responsible of just a slice of the messages per channel by leveraging on CLADB's amazing shardware algorithm. Alexi told you earlier that replacing Kafka as an order database is not so trivial using CLADB, but was surely doable. This is how we are doing it. So let's get a deep view on how it works from the scheduler component perspective. As I said before, we store the messages metadata as a time series in the buffer table, ordered by their time of the ingestion. Let me remember that this time of the ingestion is the current timestamp calculated by Sila. Each scheduler keeps a timestamp offset at the, for the last message it successfully proceeds. This offset is stored in dedicated table. So when a scheduler starts, it's fetch the time stop offsets of the shards of the data is assigned to. So now a scheduler to, uh, is simply an infinite loop fetching the messages. It's assigned to within a certain configurable time window. In fact, a scheduler will not fetch data strictly starting from the last timestamp offset, but instead from a nodeless timestamp. It does mean that the message, maybe some messages, and for sure some messages will be fetched multiple times, but this is handled by our Aiden potency business logics and optimizes memory cache. Overlapping this previous time range allow us to prevent any possible unhandled messages caused maybe by report potential write latency or time skew between nodes. Well, reaching our goal was not easy. We failed many times, 
but finally made it. So let's take a look back at our achievement and perspective with Joseph. Thank you, Yassir. So, it worked pretty well at this time, but of course, it took some iteration with their success and failures. And of course, we learned a lot. The first thing we want to emphasize is that load testing is more than useful. Quickly enough, during the development, we set up load tests, sending dozens or thousands of messages per second. Our goal was to test our data schema design at scale and in impotence guarantee. It allowed us to spot some multiple issues, sometimes non-trivial, like when the execution delay between the statement of our insertion batch was greater than our fetch time window. Yeah, a nightmare to debug. By the way, our first workload was a naive insert and delete, and load testing made large partitions appear very fast. Hopefully, we also learned about compaction strategies, and especially time window compaction strategy, which we are using now, and which allowed us to get rid of large partition issues. To make this project possible, we contributed to the Scylla ecosystem, especially to the Rust driver, with a few issues and pull requests. For example, we added the code to compute the replica nodes of a primary key, as we needed it to compute the shard of a message. We hope it will help you following this session if you want to use this cool sharding pattern in the future. We also discovered some CLADB bugs, so of course we worked with the CLADB support to have them fixed. Again, thank you very much CLADB support for your reactivity and your amazing work. As in all systems, everything is not perfect and we have some points we wish we could do better. Obviously, CLADB is not a message queuing platform, and we miss Kafka long polling. Currently, our architecture does regular fetching of each shard buffer, so that's a lot of useless bandwidth consumed, but we are working on optimizing this. Also, we encountered some memory issues where we did suspect the Scylla Rust driver, we didn't take so much time to investigate, but it made us dig into the driver code, where we spotted a lot of memory allocation. As a side project, we started to think about some optimization. Actually, we did more than think, because we wrote a whole prototype of an allocation-free driver, almost. We will maybe make it the subject of a future blog post, with a Rust driver outperforming back the Go driver. Yeah, make the Scylla Rust driver great again. So, we bet on CLADB, and that's a good thing, because it has a lot of other features that we want to benefit from. For example, change data capture. Using the CDC Kafka source connector, we can stream our message events to the rest of the infrastructure without touching applicative code. Observability made easy. And CLADB advertised about strongly consistent tables with Raft as an alternative to LWT. Currently, we are using LWT in a few places, especially for dynamic shard workload attribution. So we can't wait to test this feature. So thank you for attending this session. We hope you had a nice and unsparing time with us, and we will be happy to have a chat with you in the speaker lounge. So see you there. Bye.